period after Dashi's death until the reign of his grandson Jilugu is the least understood in the Khanite's history. To begin, we have few sources which describe the Karakatai in detail, mainly concerned with the state's founding and destruction. Further, we have none from the Karakatai themselves. The depiction we do have is generally one of decline and political stagnation. Dashi was succeeded by his wife Xiao Tuboyan, who ruled while her son Yelu Ile was still a minor. By 1151, Ile became Girhan and had an unremarkable reign. Ile was succeeded by his sister Yelu Pusuvan, whose reign is negatively depicted, sending her husband off on military missions while having an affair with his brother. This ended in both her and her lover's execution by her powerful stepfather in 1177, and the succession of Yile's second son, the final Girhan, Jilugu. Puzyavan and Jilugu's reigns were marked by the growing weakness of the Karakatai central authority to its vassal regions. Only few regions, such as the Chu Valley and Balasugun, were directly ruled by the Karakatai. The rest of the empire ruled by their vassal, like the western and eastern Karakhanids and the Khwarezmians. The problem with this indirect rule was that it needed a strong central authority and military to keep these minor kings, khans, and sultans in check. Once that central authority weakened, those rulers asserted their authority at Balusagun's expense, most notably the Khwarezm Shahs. The Khwarezm Shahs were always looking for opportunities to assert themselves the Shah Il Arslan rebelling in the early 1170s, the Karakatai then being involved with the succession dispute between Il Arslan's sons, Sultan Shah and Tekish, although Tekish couldn't assert full control of the Khwarezmian realm until after Sultan Shah's death in 1193. The next year, Tekish allied with the Abbasid Caliph and defeated and killed the final Seljuk Sultan Togrul III near Rey. Tekish promptly declared himself Sultan and betrayed the Caliph. In these two years of victory, Tekish's ambitions grew tenfold, and while he mended his relationship with the Karakatai, it must have weighed down on him. Tekish undertook warfare against his southeastern enemies, the Gurid Sultanate, convincing Zilugu to attack them after the Gurids seized Balkh in 1193. The Gurids brought a devastating defeat onto the Khitan army, killing 12,000. An enraged Zilugu blamed Tekish for the defeat, demanding he pay him 10,000 dinars for every Khitan slain. Tekish panicked and looked to the Gurids for help, who demanded rapprochement between Tekish and the Caliph against the Karakatai. Tekish died before talks could go anywhere, and was succeeded in 1200 by his son. Shah Muhammad II, who proved just as ambitious as his father. Muhammad fought the Gurids unsuccessfully and went back to the Karakatai, who sent another army under the Tayangu of Talaz, and in 1204 defeated the Gurid forces at Andhun. The brilliant Gurid Sultan Muhammad of Gore was campaigning in India and unable to take part in this warfare, and was assassinated in 1206 before he could strike back and his empire broke apart, completing a victory in favor for Shah Muhammad. As Shah Muhammad gobbled up bits of Gurid territory, he continued to eye his overlords. Jilugu was interested more in hunting than ruling, and allowed Muhammad to claim Balk and Khurazan with no interference. Jilugu, practicing the Karakatai preferred hands-off approach to ruling, may have seen it as being conciliatory, avoiding conflict and letting bygones be bygones. But the power-hungry Shah Muhammad, who must have felt his family was on a trajectory to becoming the mightiest rulers of the Muslim world, saw weakness. A political dispute in Bukhara in 1207 between two lead families saw the Shah and the Gurhan once again butt heads, each supporting a candidate. Shah Muhammad took the leap though, crossing the Amu Darya, and installed his candidate. Skirmishing and raids took place between the two, but rebellion forced both to fall back. By 1209, Shah Muhammad killed his brother, securing his flank and holding on to Khurazan and Bukhara, while Zilugu struggled to quiet uprisings in Khotan and Kashgar, Muslim territories which resented rule by the Buddhist Khitans. Over this period, a number of the vassals of the Karakatai broke away. The Karluk Khan, Arslan, and the ruler of the Uyghurs, 
Martruk would both declare their vassalage to Chinggis Khan, ruler of the new Mongol Empire. While in the west, the most powerful vassal of the Gurhans, the western Karakhanid ruler Uthman of Samarkand joined Shah Muhammad. In the middle of all this, in 1208, Shilagu took in a refugee prince from Mongolia, Kuklug of the Neyman. This was not unusual as steppe leaders often sought protection elsewhere when out of luck. Zilagu saw Yusum Kuklug giving him a daughter in marriage, bestowing favors and titles on him, and allowing him to build up a private army of others fleeing Chinggis Khan, while Zilagu intended him as another useful nomad army against his Islamic subjects and the Khwarezm Shah. Kuklug saw the weakness in the Karakatai, and having lost the Khanite he was heir to in Mongolia, found new opportunity. In early 1210, Jilagu and Muhammad came to a truce, Muhammad promising to deliver tribute, but all could see that this would not last. First, Uthman of Samarkand revolted, and Jilagu put Samarkand under siege in the spring of 1210. He was certainly shocked when he received news that his ungrateful son-in-law, Kuklug, had raided the Karakatai treasury at Uzgand. Jilagu lifted the siege and returned east and Uthman submitted to Shah Muhammad. A retaliatory force was sent under the Tayangu of Talaz, the victor at Ankund in 1204, resulting in what would have been an indecisive battle in late summer 1210, if not for the fact that Tayangu accidentally wandered into the Khwarezmian forces and was captured, allowing Shah Muhammad to claim victory as the Tayangu's army fell apart. After this victory, the already arrogant Muhammad grew in pride, and was soon calling himself God's shadow on earth. And the second Alexander, seeing himself as a true military genius which came to great consequence later on. Back east, Jilagu caught Kuklug and his army near Palasagun and defeated him, but Kuklug and most, most of his force escaped. Jilagu made to return to Balsagun, only to find that its inhabitants had barred the doors against him. Angered and now reinforced by the remnants of Tayangu's army, after a two-week siege, Jilagu forced his way into his own capital, using war elephants to break down the doors. The city was sacked and many massacred. Jilagu now had a different problem on his hands, for the years of warfare were economically draining, and leading to fiscal crisis, amplified by the loss of territory to the Khwarezmians and rebellion, and the loss of the treasury to Kuklug. Unlike most medieval states, the Karakatai prided themselves on paying their soldiers a salary, which earned loyalty and discipline, but became greatly expensive. And sacking your own capital city doesn't lend itself to confidence in the stability of your economy. In an effort to offset these financial troubles, Jilagu attempted to seize the loot his soldiers had taken from Kuklug and the sack of Balasugun. His soldiers, of course, were not thrilled at this and many deserted, fleeing now to Kuklug. Jilagu was now in quite the mess, with Kuklug still roaming in the east and much of his western territory threatened by the Khwarezm Shah, while rebellion, religious factionalism, and fiscal troubles gripped his remaining empire. Naturally, Jilagu saw this as a good time to go on a hunting trip. Now, this may not have been as bad as it sounds, depending on how it was translated, as hunting was long practiced by the Lao, the Karakatai, and the Mongols as an excellent means to train the army and improve discipline. But my research hasn't been able to distinguish if that was the purpose of this trip, or it was just Jilagu going on the medieval equivalent of golfing. Either way, in autumn 1211, he was surrounded and captured by Kukulug, who now claimed control of the Karakatai. Jilagu spent the last two years of his life as Kukulug's prisoner, kept on for nominal duties as Emperor Emeritus, but real power was in Kukulug's hands. Generally, contemporary sources see his capture in 1211, or his death in 1213, as the end of the Karakatai established by his grandfather, Yeludashi. After Jilagu's death, Kuklug of the Neyman declared himself Girhan, beginning confrontation with Shah Muhammad and soon with his old enemy, Shingis Khan. But that will be the subject of our next video.